Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you on this pre-Thanksgiving weekend. It doesn't feel like it, though, does it? It's not a lot as we look across the landscape of, well, you must be thankful for. It seems like, you know, everywhere we look, things are different. Government's trying to restrict what we can do and where we can go and who we can be with. And it's just a tough season. I want to talk about that a little bit today. And as luck would have it, you know, speaking on Thanksgiving, <laughs> as I sat down to put this message together, it was immediately after having a spat with my wife. And then it's like, you know, it's like, how do, you, how do you get into the thankful mood when you're angry? And, you know, so all of that's going to come into play here a little bit today. Don't forget to say thank you. I don't know how many times growing up I heard that from my parents. Don't forget to say thank you. And as a parent, I know I've given that advice to my children, and probably you have as well. Don't forget to say thank you. But if we're honest with ourselves, even adults, and yes, even Christians, we need to be reminded of this. Regularly, we need to be reminded of this. So I want to talk to you about being a thanksgiver, this thanksgiving. Why is it that many of us struggle with remembering to give thanks? Why is it sometimes we remember, we remember and, and sometimes we don't? I was faced with this on Friday. Why is it sometimes giving thanks seems to slip our minds? How come we need a national holiday reminding us to stop and give thanks? Ever think about that? Is that a holiday to remind us to give thanks? Especially Christians. Maybe the reason is because we're so darn busy. We forget to hit the pause button and express our thankfulness. I know I'm guilty of that. I allow the busyness of the things I have to do. It's like, ah, these things are more important. I'm too often thinking about the next thing and not the thing right in front of me. At work, we ask ourselves, what's the next steps that my job is going to need to take to grow? And how many emails do I need to respond to? And what do we need to do to get more of or less of or rid of or better at? And in our home life, I'm constantly going from one thing to another. What, what errands do I need to run? Who or what needs to be dropped off, picked up, sent somewhere else? As your kids grow and grow, you have to go and go. And in the midst of going and going and going, we fail to look back and hit the pause button and give thanks. Most of the time, it's not because we're ungrateful. It's because often... Giving thanks simply slips our mind. We just forget. And, and like I said, I struggle with this. I've forgotten to give thanks to people who have given me gifts. I've repeatedly forgotten to give thanks to people who helped me with a favor. And I'm willing to guess you have too. 
Can you imagine forgetting to give thanks to, of all people, Jesus? Well, there's an account recorded in the Bible of a time when a whole bunch of people forgot to give thanks to Jesus. I'd like to look at this account briefly today. And I want to draw one simple truth from this story. And then I want to get super practical. Because I don't want you to just know what the simple truth is. But I want to show you how to live it out on your daily life so we can become better thanksgivers. At Thanksgiving and beyond. Now... This is found in the Gospel of Luke, and as many of you know, Luke is one of my favorite authors. Because Luke's a doctor. Luke is a scientist. Luke is coming at this thing from not a a relational or religious standpoint. He's coming to write his story to get the facts. He's going to analyze things, and in his own words, he's set out to give an orderly account of the things that have happened. So he's not interested in passing along folklore or funny stories. He wants facts. And he's, he's interviewed people, he's asked the questions, and he's put down an orderly account of the things that have happened. And I like that. So so Luke interviewed a bunch of people. And after he interviewed one person, he heard this amazing story and thought, well, I've got to write this one down. This is good. And this is the story as he shares it in chapter 17 of the Gospel of Luke. Verse 11. On the way to Jerusalem... He was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. Luke is is recording that Jesus and his followers are on their way to Jerusalem for the last time, as it turns out, to celebrate one of the Jewish traditions, Passover. However, in order to get there, they had to pass through the region between Samaria and Galilee. It was just on their way. And I love that about Luke. He doesn't spare any details. He doesn't assume we know these things. And all along the way to Jerusalem are these small towns and villages that traveling caravans could stop in and rest and get supplies and then continue on their journey. Now Luke doesn't say exactly which village Jesus entered into, but we do know who was waiting for him when he arrived. That's verse 12. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. Now, leprosy is a a disease that still exists today. A horrible skin disease in which the skin slowly decays and deteriorates over time. But we don't know if that is exactly what these ten people had since the word leprosy was used for any skin condition at that time. But regardless of what their exact diagnosis was, they would have been social outcasts, pariahs. In fact, if you were diagnosed as having a skin disease, you were as good as dead in that culture. By law, you were forced to leave your family, friends, job, and live only with others who had the similar skin condition. They were quarantined together. Hmm. You were not allowed to have any contact with other people. Hmm. Whenever you were walking down the street, you were supposed to yell, Unclean! Unclean! So that people wouldn't accidentally come in contact with you. How long will it be before we have to do that, do you think? Maybe get branded with a COVID stripe. 
stay away, stay away. So it's no wonder that these 10 lepers stood at a distance from Jesus. Notice what else they did. Verse 13. And they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. This was their chance. With these people living on the outskirts of a village that was well-traveled, word had most likely spread that this rabbi, this preacher, and the healer was going to be passing through. He had healed blind men and mute men, and he would even raised the dead, and he had fed thousands. Surely he'd have the power to heal a skin disease. They waited anxiously in anticipation of the entrance of the village for Jesus to show up. Minutes. Seemed like hours. Hours. Seemed like days, and days probably seemed like years. And they waited. And they waited. Is he ever going to come? Is that him over there? Oh, no, no, false alarm. Someone else. What about there? No, that's not them either. What if he decided to take a different route to Jerusalem? What if, what if he's not coming? Finally, they see a large crowd, and in that crowd, it's him. It's him. This is the moment they've been waiting for. And they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Their cry acknowledged Jesus as their master and asked that he would have mercy, pity on them. And these shouts, they got Jesus' attention. Verse 14. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. Now for us, as we read this, it doesn't make much sense. He didn't do anything. They yelled to Jesus and he said, Well, go, go, show yourself to the priests. But as Luke's readers were first reading this, it would have been crystal clear to them. See, even though they had doctors, it was priests who were given the responsibility to determine whether or not someone was fit to rejoin society. Even when it came to skin disease, terminal illness. The people would come to the priest, and if the priest checked them out, and gave them a clean bill of health. And they could go back and rejoin their family and friends. So Jesus says, go. Show yourselves to the priests. And then something unbelievable happens. As they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. Can, can you imagine what they felt? Can you imagine how they felt as they, as they started to look down and, and their hands and then their arms and, and then their legs and their feet were, were healed, restored? And as they went, they weren't just healed, they were cleansed. Now all they had to do was present themselves to the priests and, and then they would have been able to return to their spouses, their children, their friends and loved ones. Like returning home after years of being in isolation. Like getting the all clear test to return to your family, to your job, to society. 
we should know what this feels like. They would have been thrilled. But then something even more incredible happened. Something that Luke had to write down when he heard the story being retold. He must have said to himself, I've got to make sure people know what happened next. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. This one man knew that he needed to pause and return to Jesus and give him the thanks he deserved. He stopped and he turned around and he made a beeline for Jesus. This time, instead of yelling, unclean, he goes through the crowd and with a loud voice praises God. Then when he sees Jesus again, he doesn't stand at a distance, but he, he falls at his feet and gives him thanks. Then Luke adds something for his readers that, that we don't quite understand. Now, he was a Samaritan. We read that and we're like, well, that's not a big deal. Jesus loves everybody. We sing about it all the time. But, but Luke's readers would have read this and said, whoa, wait a minute. A Samaritan? That's a huge deal. Are you sure it was a Samaritan? Samaritans are, are looked down on by the Jews. Of all the people to turn around and give thanks to Jesus, it was a Samaritan? Huh. And Jesus, he responds with three questions. Were not all ten cleansed? Where, where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? You can almost hear the indignation in his voice. We don't like to think about Jesus that way. I like to think of Jesus as all grace and mercy. But Jesus has a serious question. Where are the other nine? Where are my people? Telling me the only one that could bring me thanks was the foreigner? Huh. Why did only one person return? What was it that made this man pause? Turn around and give praise. Weren't they all grateful? Well, come on, of course they were grateful. Of course they were grateful. Their lives were going to change forever. They had to be grateful. But one person, one individual, turned gratefulness into thankfulness. He turned from being grateful into being thankful. See, being grateful is an emotion. Grateful is a feeling. But being thankful is an action. Thankful is doing something about it. 
instead of continually looking forward towards the things he was going to do, he paused. He turned back. And he turned his gratefulness for what Jesus had done into thankfulness for what Jesus had done. There's one thing I think Jesus is trying to get at with these questions that he asked. There's one thing that Luke is trying to get at by recording this story. If there's one thing I'm trying to nail down with you, it's this. In your busy schedule, pause. Turn your grateful into thankful. Turn your thoughts of I'm grateful for this or I'm grateful for that person into action, into an expression, into doing something. It's one thing to be grateful about something, but to be thankful about something takes action. It takes doing something, just like this man that was healed. This man paused and turned grateful into thankful. And then Jesus said something to him that was even more incredible than, than being healed. Jesus said something to him that would have made him thankful, not just for the rest of the day, but for the rest of his life. And that same thing ought to cause us to be thankful for the rest of our lives as well. Verse 19. And he said to him, rise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Literally, in the, in the original language, that means your faith has saved you. Jesus says, I didn't just come here to cleanse you from a physical disease. I came for so much more that you may be saved. For one man, is, his life changed the day he paused and turned his grateful into thankful. For some of you, your life can change the day you pause and turn your gratefulness for what Jesus has done into thankfulness for what Jesus has done. Now, I want to get super practical for you. Many of you have already made the decision to follow Christ and give Him thanks. I don't doubt that for a moment. But don't let your thankfulness stop with Jesus. Because there are people in your life whom the Lord has used that you need to give thanks to. Giving thanks is crucial when it comes to the overall health of our families, our places of work, standing out in the world, and in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And I know it's not always easy. And what I would like to do is get super specific because I don't want you to leave here wondering how do you turn grateful into thankful? Because I think we can all identify people in areas where we need to give thanks. So I want to share four ways that I think make giving thanks so much better. To become a thanks giver. First, be specific. When we, when we are turning grateful into thankful, we need to be specific when we give thanks. The reason for this is the people need to know that you know what they've done. I've never learned this more than in ministry. I am so very grateful for all of you. No matter what you believe about what you bring to the operation of this church, every one of you brings something. I know this has been a particularly difficult year. Many, well, most of the operations of what we've come to expect has been on hold. 
And sometimes it doesn't feel like it's ever going to return to normal. And maybe it's not supposed to return to normal to what it was. Who knows? But I know this. Whatever happens after all this craziness is done, when we are again free to determine what we do and how we congregate, it's going to require all of us to shape and build what our new normal is. And the, ses- and the success of the transition will rest upon our ability to recognize and acknowledge the efforts of each person as we work to develop the new normal. So thank you in advance for the work it's going to take to restore this church to vibrancy. Because it will take us all. Second, we need to be honest. Because people can tell when you're on a thought, when, when, when you're on a unauthentic if you aren't thankful don't fake it don't fake it don't say thanks because you feel like you're supposed to say thanks if you're only if you're truly thankful the Samaritan didn't turn and go back to Jesus and give thanks because it was what he was supposed to do He did because that's what he wanted to do. He was genuine. Make it public. This one hurts. Make it public. It's one thing to tell someone thank you. If you ever get the right opportunity, be thankful for someone in public. I know it has to be the right setting, but Maybe before your next business meeting or before your next small group or even before your next family dinner. Just pause for a moment. Pause and tell the group how thankful you are for what they did. Share how thankful you are that it's so-and-so is a part of your team or organization. Perhaps at the dinner table, share how thankful you are for what your child or your spouse did. Find something. Finally, make it permanent. Make it permanent. Put it in writing. When you're able to write someone an email, a text, or even better, a handwritten note that demonstrates how thankful you are, It stays with them. It shows you've been thinking about them and went above and beyond to let them know. I keep every card and letter, every note I get. This little pack is in my desk. This is very special to me. Because they represent the times that somebody took to express specific thanks to me for something. And why this is important is I get down. I feel like I'm inadequate most times. I look at the landscape and think, what am I doing? I don't know how to lead. I don't know how to pastor. When I get like that, I can open this packet up. And I can read the truth about what other people took the time to remind me of. I do hear from the Lord. I do have a calling. I do make a difference. I do impact lives. 
And on the worst day when the enemy wants to drag me down, I've got a desk full, drawer full of ammunition to stand against that. It reminds me what the truth is. <clears throat> How much would your letter, your note, to someone else reminding them of how grateful you are for them or how thankful or how much you see what they've done for you in your life. The little inconsequential things that maybe they don't even recognize that meant a big difference. It could be the thing that pulls them out of a depression. Tossing their hands in the air and say, I give up. So much about our Christian life is not giving up. Because that's what the enemy is after us for, to give up. To believe the lie that it's worthless. To believe the lie that we're wasting our time. To believe the lie that it's all made up. And we have to be people who can stand and say, this is truth. <clears throat> And what it says about me is true. And what it says about you is true. We have to be those people that recognize that and carry that forward to others. So turn your grateful into thankful by being specific, being honest, Make it public. Make it permanent. But I hope this is not a one and done thing for you. I want you to think about this as, oh, this is what I have to do on Thursday because the pastor exhorted me to be thankful to someone. I want this to be a life. Can you imagine what it would look like if just over the next week or two we, we got this one truth right? <laughs> we got this one thing right? What would your dinner table look like if you and your family paused and turned being grateful into being thankful regularly? What would it look like if you and your family paused from your hectic, crazy schedule of going, going, going and start expressing thankfulness? Not just I'm thankful we're all here around the table and that the kids can make it home. Not just I'm thankful for this meal. But specific things that someone else has done that makes you want to authentically give thanks. Thursday, you might take a moment to thank everyone responsible for the meal. Not just, hey, honey, thanks for cooking the turkey. But maybe actually acknowledging the extra time and effort it takes to plan a big meal. The shopping, the cleaning, the coordinating. This year, see for what it truly is, a larger effort and operation than just a meal. It's more than just a meal. And take the time to thank all the players. But don't let it just be about Thanksgiving, the holiday. Because this Christmas season looks to be pretty challenging as well. We're liable to see many of the family traditions we look forward to each year affected and changed. And that can be pretty tough when you don't get to do the things you've done for generations. Feels unfair, makes you angry, makes you focus on what you don't have instead of what we do.
we've got to be people of thanks. Because even in the darkest of things, even in the worst, the emptiest of times, there are things and there are people to be thankful for. I know you're grateful, but in our busy world, we must pause and turn grateful into thankful. What if you went into your workplace tomorrow morning and you weren't just grateful for the people you work with, but you showed them, either publicly or privately, how thankful you are for them? Can you imagine if that kind of generosity was simply common practice? What if, what if believers in this church, who I know are very grateful, started not just to be grateful, but paused and turned that gratefulness into thankfulness? What if it became so ingrained that we changed the name of the holiday from Thanksgiving to Thanksgiving? Can you imagine what a guest would feel like if they came into this church and they observed a group of people being genuinely thankful for one another? But not just for one another, but thankful for God. See, here's the beauty of this truth. Truth is one of the reasons why we come to church. It's one of the reasons why I, I love church. I love coming to church on Sunday. Even when I don't want to. Even when I don't feel prepared. Because it's a time in our busy weekly schedule where we slow down and we come together. And through prayer and song and giving and fellowship and even the preaching we can turn our grateful into thankful. It's a time where we can specifically and honestly demonstrate our thankfulness to God, both publicly and privately, in our own hearts and our own minds. So every week, including today, let's pause and turn our grateful into thankful. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for all that you've done for us. Even when we didn't deserve it. Lord, that makes us grateful for the saving work of Jesus on the cross. We're so very grateful that we get to live our lives for you and we get to spend eternity with you. All the things that we don't deserve. But Lord, forgive us where we're not thankful for that. How we take this thing for granted. How we take each other for granted. How we take our churches and our, our institutions and our families and our jobs and all of the things that you've provided for us. We take it for granted. Lord, forgive us when we feel like we are deserving of what we have. Lord, our entire society wants us to be, become victims. Right now we're victims of COVID and we're victims of our circumstance and things are being done to us and we should be deserving and demanding. And Lord, that's not how your people should act all the people on the earth, we should know the difference. And we should be willing to stand in thankfulness to you and demonstrate that for a world that is needing the hope that we have. Lord, let our thankfulness be the vision of hope for a dark and hurting world. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Help us Help us 
to be thankful in everything that we do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Enjoy your Thanksgiving. Enjoy your thanks living. <laughs>